Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another Hopi on the Headlines. Today, we have a great conversation planned with Claude Muhizi, who is our Monitoring and Evaluation Manager in Rwanda, where women can finally return to their trainings. And during the program suspension, Claude and his colleagues had been doing a lot of work to stay in touch with program participants and ensure their well-being. So we're very excited to have Claude to speak to today. Hi, Claude. Hi. Yeah, thank you for hosting me. Yeah, Claude, so much of your role is involved with doing interviews with women in our program, and now you're the one being interviewed. So it's, it's a pleasure for me to be in this position. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure. Great. Okay, so a few months ago, we were having conversations with your colleagues about how the Rwanda team was adapting to the lockdowns, and social distancing measures put in place to uh, fight the COVID-19 pandemic. And because Rwanda implemented many health and safety measures to address the pandemic, lockdowns are now easing and we've been able to resume the training for women. Could you talk a little more about how restarting the training has been going and also what does that process look like? Yeah, thank you. Um... As uh, the government provides the, the guidelines time and again, depending on the situation, uh, we have uh, uh, been lucky that uh, there were some uh, restrictions that were lifted. And uh, uh, actually before we, we couldn't like have free movements from one district to the other. The, we were like confined in one place. And when there were uh, guidelines allowing like uh, movement in the other communities. Uh, we we started uh, discussions with local authorities in different districts, and uh, uh, put in place uh, you know measures uh, of prevention, and I started discussion around having uh, to resume activities, and uh, we we made discussions. That deferred depending on the on the location, uh, because some of the locations are even today in the lockdown, uh, and uh, we started with the with the eastern part in in in, in the Yisira district. Uh, so we had uh, measures in place. Uh, we had uh, to introduce like fewer numbers. We, because we normally have classes of 25 women together, but we, we now discussed on the way of reducing the numbers uh, and to, just to, to, to allow the possibility of having uh, the social distance between these participants. Uh, so we, we even installed uh, some sanitary equipment of washing hands. We had soaps around and, 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 and water in those in those uh, equipment installed and distributed uh, face masks, which are also an obligation to everyone who is going to to go to the public, like going outside the homes. And so um, we we even have uh, like these thermomet thermometers to measure the temperature. So, uh, and in brief, I would say that we we are we are happy that in most of the in the places we have resumed but not everywhere. So we are still waiting to see how uh, the situation unfolds. Yeah, thank you. And it sounds like you you and the team have already put together some measures to make sure that as women continue with the program and are able to restart, that measures are being taken to ensure their health and safety, like reducing the size of class. Um, could you repeat some of those measures that help keep women safe in the in the new phase of the program where we're restarting. Yeah, exactly. Among the, the measures, well, we, they, they cut across into women themselves and, and, for the, and, and the staff, because we, we all are concerned and uh, I, I will be particular with the training sites where we, we had to install these equipments. They have to stay there under under the safeguard of the of the local authorities, mainly at the, the sector level, because they they, they they assure us of the security because we can't bring and take them back 
and uh, and yes we had uh, again to recall like remind ourselves on uh, on all these measures that are prescribed by the minister of health and who of course so we we also discussed on if we for instance uh, become suspicious if someone has like an abnormal body temperature or is coughing. So we, we have even the, the toll free number to call, and, and even we can we, we decided that we can also involve the local authorities who are who have the mandate in terms of health. Then we would, we would always you know know how to handle the situation that might emerge. Yeah, thank you. That's that's really a lot of important work and it, it takes a lot of time to implement. So thank you to you and your colleagues for doing all of that. Uh, I want to know, how do women feel about returning to training? What have you been able to hear and learn from women who are restarting the yeah. program? Yeah, they are extremely happy because uh, this lockdown, like anyone of us here, well, you know, frustrated us because uh, businesses were interrupted, social life was interrupted, and so the same applied to, to these, these women. Though in the, country, in the countryside, uh, like these people who are working on farms, there, is that, there was that flexibility of like going to their farm, but uh, again, if you, if you look at transportation of products, let's say, it wasn't easy because there was no free movement from one district to the other, and so that affects the, the women's earnings, and then the, the, it also affects how they access like food or whatever other commodities that they'll be wanting to see. And so specifically uh, put, because of the interruption of the trainings that Women for Women had already started, the, these women were also like uh, also uh, frustrated in terms of like going further, with the trainings and, and and continuing their work with the VSLAs because they normally come together and and save money together in the VSLA groups. So all this was like on on hard for, for that period. And then they felt so much impressed of now having the, their life come to normal. But of, of course, uh, knowing what awaits them because restrictions are like also very tight in Rwanda. And we're really looking forward to women resuming um, any sense of normal that they can. Thank you. Yeah. So one thing that the Rwanda team was able to do also was pivot to delivering cash support through mobile money transfers. Can you talk a little bit more about this and especially how having that money has impacted women during this crisis? I think that reminds me of one of the measures that, was, that is in place of cashless you know uh, transactions and then then we are always obliged like to use where possible the the information like uh, digital way of 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 purchasing goods and and, and, and services and so uh, that also was transferred into uh, into provision of of of, of stipends to to women to, to, to to, to participants, uh, so we, we we only used in this case uh, uh, mobile money channel, and then we we had to reach out to each and every participant to the um, telephone SIM cards of their own, because we we, are, we had partnership with the telecommunication company uh, MTN, and so we we had to to make sure that whoever receive the stipend, receive it on the SIM card that belongs to, to, to them, themselves. So uh, it, it happened that some like had those telephones that are not registered in their own names, but we, 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 you know, we worked hard to have at least each of the participants now receive the stipends. And yeah, we succeeded in having it, though some of them, we had to go back and then uh, make the deal, register again, into their own names. And uh, the, the result of having these women receive stipends, well, it, it also support them in, in accessing all these preventive measures we are talking about. Like if it's about having soap at home, it's about looking for food, it's about 
yeah, everything concerning their ordinary life, I think the stipends were very useful in 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 that respect. Yeah, having to do with uh, uh, struggling like to to survive when they are not working or operating in a normal in normal way. Yeah, that's great. And it's also a really uh, promising way for us to be able to leverage technology in order to continue serving women, especially at a time when person-to-person -person interaction is so limited and restricted. That's it. I think we should not step back anymore because that's the, that's why we, 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 that's the direction actually should take henceforth. Yeah, good. And I hope other countries are able to, to pick that up as well. Um, so another incredible effort that we've seen your team do, uh, and especially your graduates of the Rwanda program, is that graduates have come together at the Women's Opportunity Center to be able to make face masks during this time. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, soon after the, the, the government, actually the, the government uh, brings up uh, guidelines regularly, and it's a uh, it comes from the cabinet meeting, which uh, sits every 15 days. And we, we, we actually gradually keep on getting new guidelines. And uh, soon after the, the, put the, the, the face, mask, face masks were like um, deemed necessary for, for everyone who is, doing, who is going to the public, we, we started um, together with WOC uh, to work with graduates who who um, uh, uh, are tailoring, and then we started working with them to have face masks produced. In one, in one way, it was about them generating an income, and in the other way, it was having the face masks for us to protect ourselves, including participants. And then uh, um, it was uh, um, a requirement that, that WOC as a facility uh, request for an authorization from the government, from uh, Rwanda Foods and, and, and Drugs Authority, which provides the, the authorization based on the standards. Because um, production of face masks is not done like uh, anyway, anyhow. So um, we secured the authorization and then we're starting with uh, around 20 graduates at WOC. Uh, we started producing face, the face masks. And uh, so it just uh, uh, after a few days, we had uh, collaboration with Gaia Links, and uh, who brought also an, an additional number of, of 80 women. So the, 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 the production capacity came to about 4,000 per day. And uh, we have seen uh, like at our office, we received 11,000 of, of that, those face masks that we have distributed across the, these communities I told you. We, and, and, this, and then the process is still going on. That's amazing. And it's especially amazing because these women learned and practiced the skill through the program and now they're able to use it to come together and help support their own communities. It's really, really interesting. Yeah, great, yeah, yeah. It is interesting, actually. That's great. So finally, I want to talk about the future. And what would you say are your hopes for the future of women in Rwanda? Yeah, the, the future lies in the skills, in the knowledge that they have acquired. I think they are able to, to thrive in this situation like anyone of us would. Uh, particularly that they, there is uh, the support from the government and the, and the stakeholders, Women for Women inclusive, that are supporting it, uh, every day um, the success of, uh, of these entrepreneurs, the, the, the small scale business people. And so these uh, women have also acqu have acquired the skills that uh, help them become competitive into this market I'm talking about, although it has staggered a bit because of the COVID-19 effects. But I can see the future very promising. Um, actually, some women were telling us that they, they, they are using the knowledge they acquired like in, 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 a, in hygiene, in nutrition, 
in all those areas and they are spreading it to their counterparts, now that the need of hygiene has actually been to the top, maybe before it was some, something like wastage of time, but now they now realize why this hygiene and, and, and nutrition and, and, and prevention against HIV and AIDS and, and, and uh, uh, knowing the productive health issues and, and, and uh, all of these things are like now uh, appearing to be very useful. And then they are capable of like moving forward given those skills and, and, and the, the environment they are in today. I see the future, of course, we are very optimistic that they, they will make it happen. Yeah, great. And on behalf of everyone here, you know, we, we share those hopes and that future. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, Claude. You and your team have worked so hard just to stay in touch with participants. And now that the program is restarting, working so hard to make sure that they're able to restart the program safely and effectively. And also just the women who are stepping up to protect their communities. Um, these are graduates of our program who have already been through challenging times and are still able to step up and support their communities. It's, it's very, um, uh, very great to hear and um, we're, we're happy that you're able to share these experiences with us. Thank you, Claude. Yeah, thank you to everyone who is, you know, who is uh, uh, having sleepless nights. Just think about how the program would be like enduring and, produ and producing the required results. Thank you to everyone who is supporting. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Claude, and your team. Thank you. Too. So if you enjoyed today's conversation, be sure to continue supporting women and investing in them by signing the pledge, see her, support her. And please also subscribe to Women for Women on social media to stay up to date on how the coronavirus crisis is affecting women around the world and what you can do to help support them. Thanks again for joining. <laughs>